In darkened rooms like these, members of one of the world's most secret organizations reflect on the fleeting nature of life and their own mortality. To such men, these are all potent symbols of transformation. In chambers of reflection, the skull reminds them that flesh will one day decay. The hourglass shows the relentless power of time. The scythe is for what nature gives and takes away. And the unlit candle represents the waking of man from ignorant slumber. This clandestine group believes that we live in a modern dark age and that they hold the key to human liberation through enlightenment. Using ancient wisdom, they can unleash truly awesome powers in the human mind. Welcome to the world of the Freemasons. Or at least that's what one of the world's best-selling authors would have us believe. Thank you, Alice. Welcome to the world of Dan Brown's Lost Symbol. The Lost Symbol is Dan Brown's latest thriller. Set in Washington, D.C., it's a high-octane chase across the city in search of the lost wisdom of the ancients. Brown serves up his signature dish of mystic symbolism, intrigue, kidnapping and murders with a healthy side order of radical science and a quest for superhuman power. Only this time, it's the Freemasons who are in the spotlight. As usual with his thrillers, it's all a bit over the top. So just as I did with The Da Vinci Code, I'm going to take this one with a tiny pinch of salt. After all, it is a novel, except it makes a quite extraordinary claim near the front. It says, all organisations in this novel exist, all rituals, science, artwork and monuments in this novel are real. But is that really true? Do Freemasons really drink blood out of a skull? Are there ancient secrets that turn men into gods? Can you really move objects through the power of thought alone? Can you actually weigh a human soul? Oh, I'm going to enjoy this one. The Lost Symbol is all about the Freemasons. The book kicks off with a sinister-sounding initiation ceremony. Washington's most senior Freemason is violently kidnapped, the bad guys trying to steal powerful Masonic secrets, and cryptologist Robert Langdon is sucked into the sordid affair, running through creepy reflection chambers and mysterious Masonic temples on a desperate mission to crack codes and save his friend's life. But the strange thing is, on reading the book, you discover that Dan Brown absolutely loves Masons. He thinks they're the most trustworthy people in the world, which is just as well, because they are the guardians of a secret ancient knowledge. They hold the key to mysterious powers, which, if they fell into the wrong hands, would be incredibly dangerous. According to Brown, this secret ancient knowledge can unlock godlike powers that lie dormant within us. But only a handful of people can do this, those who are deemed worthy. This is really powerful stuff. And if it's true, as Dan Brown says it is, then I really ought to get in on it. Thank you. I've come to the United Grand Lodge of England. It's the oldest Masonic Lodge in England. Here's my first surprise. The doors aren't locked and bolted. I can walk straight in. No passwords, nothing. I'm immediately struck by ancient-looking symbols. Upstairs, I come face to face with my first Freemason. Tenny, welcome to Freemasons Hall. Thank you very much. You know, that feels just like an ordinary handshake. 
Tell you that's exactly what it is. It's a perfectly normal handshake. I'm slightly disappointed by that. So you're not going to threaten me with death if I divulge any of your secrets? Not at all. Can I see the Chamber of Reflection? There is no such room here. Oh, no. So Dan Brown got it just a little bit wrong? He did. Come show me around. A pleasure. This is one of our lodge rooms. It's uh, very typical. If I was about to be initiated in this room, what would happen? Would you be blindfolded? You are blindfolded when you first come in because you're coming from the darkness into the light. You're being born, if you like. Dan Brown says that you swear an oath that says that you won't give away any Masonic secrets and that if you break them, all sorts of horrible things will happen to you. Well, that's entirely historical and uh, th they were purely symbolic in the old days anyway. I'm almost embarrassed to ask this. Do you really roll a trouser leg up? The answer to that is yes, we do. Really? On the first ceremony. Why? This is, again, symbolic, that when you were working in the quarries, you had to roll it up to show the state of your leg, because if it was diseased or weak, then you wouldn't have the strength to work in the quarry. Now, the key thing to note is that's the only time and we don't walk around with our trouser legs rolled up. Medieval stonemasonry is the source of the symbols, rituals and language of Freemasonry today. It's also the root of much of its secrecy. Once the builders of fabulous castles and cathedrals, stonemasons were considered to be masters of a magical art. They were important members of society, answerable to kings and bishops, and the skills they passed on to their apprentices were jealously guarded. In a period of mass illiteracy, it's likely an elaborate system of secret handshakes and passwords identified members of the stonemason fraternity. It's thought that the very first Masonic groups evolved out of stonemason's guilds, eventually dropping the artisan element but maintaining the secret rituals. And stone carving tools are used to express their moral philosophy today. This is the... Compass, do you call this? Yes, this shows the unerring and impartial justice of the Almighty. And that? This square teaches us all about morality. What's it all about? What's it for? Friendship. The joy for me is that our members can all meet together in harmony and equality. These are hardly the secrets of the ancients Dan Brown's on about. I'm not convinced Nigel's telling me everything. These doors are absolutely fantastic. What do the pictures mean? This is depicting the building of King Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple, built in stone and a biblical icon. I must be close. What's inside? It's a most beautiful room. If any time there's going to be the wow factor, this will be it. Oh, I'm wild. This theme continues inside. The overly elaborate ceiling is covered in figures and symbols from the ancient world. It's also as camp as Shirley Bassey, isn't it? Yes. This is where people who are getting a Masonic rank actually get invested with that rank. Surrounded by all this ancient iconography. It's all about wisdom, beauty, knowledge. Are you avoiding telling me what it means? I'm not avoiding anything at all. There are no secrets. But Dan Brown says that you guys are the guardians of ancient knowledge and wisdom. Sadly, we're not. You promise me? I promise you. <sighs> well, it all seemed pretty open and honest in there, but disappointing, really. There are little secrets and rituals there, but they're all medieval, just a bit of play acting, not ancient at all. And as for Nigel, well, he hardly fills you with shock and dread, does he? He's more like the keeper to the stationary cupboard than the keeper to any ancient mysteries. To be fair to Dan Brown, though, he didn't write his book about this country, he wrote it about the US. And maybe if the Masons did have any ancient knowledge, they took it over there with them. I think I'd better go and find out. Taxi. I'm in Washington, D.C., on the trail of Dan Brown's lost symbol.
I want to know if there's any truth in its claims that America is and always has been in the grip of Masonic power. Mr. Robinson. Yes. Hello. Welcome to the Hotel Helix. How are you? Very well. Good. Here you go. Here's your Dan Brown book. I got this free? Yes, it comes with your Dan Brown package. Thank you very much. You also get a map to help you navigate the different places in the book. Thank you. And yeah, definitely, DC has gone crazy for Dan Brown's lost symbol. Obviously, yeah. Your room is at the end of the hall and to the left for the elevator. Thank you, Holland. All right. You're very welcome. Enjoy your stay. Will do. Dan Brown hysteria has taken over the town. Even the DC Tourist Board's website is emblazoned with lost symbol links and suggested city tours highlighting locations from the book. Washington Monument, Washington National Cathedral, Library of Congress. Too much information. I could start virtually anywhere. Almost the entire book set in Washington. But I mustn't get distracted. I'm going to begin at the beginning. And that's with George Washington and the Founding Fathers. The men who created the United States were political idealists. Their revolutionary and democratic ideas were common both to enlightened thinkers of the 18th century and to Freemasons, whose core values included fraternity, equality and liberty. So could Masonic principles be at the heart of the American Revolution? This story doesn't start in Washington, D.C. In 1776, this place didn't exist. Back then, America was just 13 states administered from London. The locals were tired of paying tax to the British Crown without representation, and so the Revolutionary War began. Many Freemasons found themselves on the front line fighting against their king. Throwing out the Brits was one thing, creating a nation from scratch was another. It was a unique opportunity to shake off the religion and monarchy of the old world and build a utopian society. But did the Founding Fathers have a Masonic agenda? I've come to where it all began, Philadelphia, capital of the new nation in the immediate aftermath of the revolution. It's not often that you can walk into an American building and feel as though you can actually smell the history. But this place is an exception because it was here in the old colonial Pennsylvania State House in the summer of the year 1776 that the United States of America itself was conceived. The colonial states were on the verge of announcing to the world not only their liberty but also their destiny. All the men in this hall shared the revolutionary spirit, but some were Freemasons, perhaps there to stamp their mark on the political future of the United States. Dan Brown identifies a number of key founding fathers as Freemasons. Benjamin Franklin, the father of the revolution, published the first book on Freemasonry in America. And he was later joined in the Brotherhood by none other than George Washington, the first president of the United States. Here in Alexandria, just a few miles from the White House, is George Washington's National Masonic Memorial. It commemorates Washington the Mason. It houses his Masonic possessions and a vast statue of him in apron and full regalia. So some Founding Fathers were Masons, but did they really have significant influence? Could these be the Masonic States of America? If so, we should be able to see the mark of Freemasons in their political statement of intent, the Declaration of Independence. If this is a Masonic plot, then it should be riddled with their language and ideas. This is it, this is the real Declaration of Independence. Unfortunately, it was kept in front of a fireplace uh, with the sun blazing into the room for about 70 years. So it's degraded and virtually the only thing that you can see is that hand mark down there, which is the hand mark of one of the founding fathers who really should have scrubbed up a bit before he signed the document. 
Unfortunately, around about 1820, they made a copper plate copy of it, so we can actually still see what's written there. You see, about the third line from the top, there's the famous bit. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And then about three or four lines from the bottom, they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. And all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. Resistance to the British Crown is hardly Masonic, but maybe I'm missing something. I meet with Akram Elias, a top-ranking Freemason, for another take on the document. You are a Mason, yeah? I am. Do you think the creation of America was a Masonic experiment? I personally believe so. There are so many principles that we see in Freemasonry, and then we obviously see having influenced um, the shaping of the basic documents and of the way the country came to be. I've seen the Declaration of Independence. I can't see anything Masonic in it. Am I being naive? No, you're not being naive, but let me tell you, it's just you have to look very carefully. Here's the uh, a copy of the Declaration of Independence. Just look here, right here, the second line. The law of nature and of nature's God. This is at the heart of the entire document. The founding fathers of our country, and more especially the Masons among them, believed in the natural order of the universe. And if you look carefully at the rituals of Freemasonry, more especially the fellow crafts uh, ritual, there is a very important lecture. This is something that's contained within the secret black book of the Masons? I don't, wouldn't call it the secret black book, but I would call it the ritual of Freemasonry. It is, is secret and it yes. is black. This is part of the teachings in the second degree. It says that the entire endeavor is to imitate the divine plan which manifests itself in nature. Like the pursuit of happiness? Oh, my God, you put your finger on the most important thing, the in pursuit of happiness. Oh, absolutely, right here, inalienable right. The right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our aim is to be happy and to work towards the promotion of happiness. But is this really Masonic text? or just the utopian language of the day. One man holds the key. Here, in his memorial, he stands high and proud, the intellectual father of the nation, Thomas Jefferson. He was the principal author of the Declaration of Independence, and his idealistic words are woven tightly into the very fabric of the United States. If America was anyone's vision, it was his. The progressive values Jefferson championed, liberty, equality, and representative democracy, were in tune with Freemasonry, as were his calls for universal education. This ideal was set in stone in the Library of Congress, which grew out of his own personal collection of books. In the lost symbol, the hero Robert Langdon takes refuge here, momentarily stalling his escape from the CIA to marvel at its architectural glory. Dan Brown says this is possibly the most beautiful building in the world. It's hard to argue with that, isn't it? It's a shame not more people have seen it. <laughs> I know that the building was created at the end of the 19th century, but it does seem to bear the imprint of the Founding Fathers. Why was it so important that they should have a library? Well, words were very important to them. Just look at the rough draft of the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. But um, Jefferson said it best, they needed information. He said, there is no subject to which a member of Congress may not have occasion to refer. So, we're now entering the main reading room of the library. It's like a huge exercise in self-improvement. Yes, well, and that's what all of these figures are here to represent. The female allegorical figures that represent the highest pursuits of the human mind. Science, law, poetry, history, philosophy. And not particularly Christian. No, no, very secular. Religion is here, but she's just one of eight figures. It's almost Masonic, isn't it? Well, it's not a Masonic building. It just shares some of the same iconography. 
and I really think it's one of the most magnificent rooms in Western architecture. Surely then a fitting legacy for the most enlightened founding father. But guess what? Thomas Jefferson wasn't a Mason. He shared many of the ideals of Freemasonry, liberty, equality, freedom of speech, that kind of thing. But he saw them as common sense values. In other words, Freemasonry didn't have a monopoly on enlightened ideas. So while a handful of founding fathers were Masons, America wasn't their creation. There was no Masonic master plan. But how about the nation's capital, Washington, D.C.? In the words of Dan Brown, a city conceived by master Masons. Could he be right? In The Lost Symbol, Dan Brown makes some pretty bold claims about the Masonic heritage of Washington, D.C. Cashing in on countless conspiracy theories, he exploits suggestions that George Washington and his friends adorned their new capital city with Masonic symbolism, architecture and art. So what's the reality? George Washington wanted a capital to rival the great European cities. He hired Pierre L'Enfant, a French-born architect, who Dan Brown claims was a mason. L'Enfant duly came up with a grandiose design for the city, which included a curiously elaborate street plan. This is the original L'Enfant plan of Washington, and you can see that it's designed in a grid shape, but it's not the standard grid that you might get in somewhere like Milton Keynes or Harlow Newtown. There are lots of stars exploding all the way over it. And in addition, there are all these diagonal lines, all these avenues crisscrossing the grid as well. And what that means is that if you look at it very closely, shapes start to emerge out of it. Little little symbols and things. Above the White House, a pentagram. Masonic. Between the White House and the Capitol, a set square. Really Masonic. And apexed on the Capitol, a compass. Super Masonic. Some people say it isn't coincidence. It's a deliberate attempt to imprint Masonic symbolism onto the city. It's certainly intriguing enough to visit one of Washington's top architects to get his opinion. L'Enfant found a new way of combining the geometry of radiating avenues that was more orderly and I believe was expressive of our new government. But it's been argued that there's actually a Masonic logic about the city itself, that in a sense uh, the, uh, the city is the ideology of the Masons in stone. Oh, it's an interesting idea and one can find in looking at the plan, geometric symbols, but I would say that it would be difficult to do a plan anything like Washington's and not find those symbols. I'm not sure you're not dismissing this evidence really rather too easily. Have a look here. You've got the White House there, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania Avenue, the Capitol. Mm -hmm. You've got another avenue going down there. Mm -hmm. You've got an avenue here. You've got something of an avenue there. What that describes is a compass, which is the preeminent symbol of the Masons. Mm -hmm. That can't be coincident, surely. I believe it is. L'Enfant had hoped to have a canal coming this way. When it didn't work out, he just dropped it. So we don't really have that arm of that compass. So, all right, if it was one thing, I could buy that. But look, a pentagram, which again is a profound Masonic symbol, isn't it? It is, and you could probably find five or six more in here if you looked for them. This is really the result of a set of avenues that were doing a job. Do you believe that there's a Masonic influence in the design of the city? Not at all. I concede that this is a stretch. I'd probably find funny shapes in the street plans for Milton Keynes. And in any case, Dan Brown got it wrong. L'Enfant wasn't a Mason. His plan for the city didn't hide any Masonic secrets. But how about the monuments of Washington, D.C.? 
One structure in particular is visible from all over the city and gets Dan Brown's pulse racing. This curious obelisk, the Washington Monument, is the world's tallest stone structure. It harks back to ancient Egypt, as do so many Masonic symbols and myths. It does seem to me a bit bizarre that slap bang in the heart of America's capital, you've got this enormous Egyptian obelisk. It is the official monument to George Washington, who was a Freemason. Yeah. And the architect of the Washington Monument was also a Freemason, Robert Mills. And the obelisk has great Masonic significance. First of all, the measurements yeah. of the Washington Monument. It's 555 feet in elevation and 55 feet by 55 feet at the base. What's all the fives about? Five is a very important Masonic number. It is associated with the builder. The five senses, the five fingers, the five classical orders of architecture, that is all in the rituals of Freemasonry. What does the obelisk actually mean? Well, Egyptians built obelisks dedicated to the sun god, Ra. An obelisk is a cross-section of a beam of light. And George Washington... I don't know what you're talking about. Well, <laughs> you know, think about it. The spectrum of sunlight. It is made up of seven colors, the seven colors of the rainbow. So, so why the... is that significant in the middle uh, of the capital? Because George Washington succeeded in bringing together the diverse populations of the colonies to form one nation. It's the Rainbow Coalition. It is a pluribus unum the motto of our country, out of many, one. A pluribus unum, to be seen on every dollar bill in America. Taxi. Our hero, Robert Langdon, and the beautiful scientist, Catherine Solomon, are in a cab heading down Pennsylvania Avenue because they're trying to escape from the CIA. And behind them, the lights are flashing, and there's trucks, and there's cars. And if they're caught, they know that they'll have to surrender the ancient mysteries which they've sworn to protect. And Catherine is trying to work out the latest puzzle that they've been confronted with. And suddenly she goes, ah! Stop the cab! Stop the cab! That's what she says. But stop the cab anyway. Okay, thanks, sir. What she was showing him was this, a one dollar bill, which she can see is absolutely riddled with Masonic symbols. You see this unfinished pyramid? That's a massive Masonic symbol. And above it, you've got an all-seeing eye. That was such a big Masonic symbol that George Washington had one of these on his Masonic apron. But this is the, the weird thing. If you alter the triangle created by the eye and the pyramid into a Solomon seal, another word for the Star of David, by doing that, see what letters all the ends of that Star of David are pointing at? M, A, S, O, N, Mason. And if that isn't mind-boggling, you've got exactly the same image here at the very centre of Freedom Plaza in the heart of the nation's capital. This is one of the most famous pyramids in the world. According to Dan Brown, no image in history has been printed more. And probably none have created such Masonic debate. The pyramid is one half of the Great Seal, America's national emblem. The flip side shows an eagle clutching 13 arrows and 13 olive branches behind 13 stars and 13 stripes. The number 13 being a Masonic power number. I've gone right to the top to find out if this has any significance. I don't want to be disrespectful to your great country, but what's this weird eye in a hayrick? Well, the all-seeing eye, the eye of providence, is an ancient symbol. It has often been associated with uh, Freemasonry, but oh. it is just as often in a context outside of Freemasonry. The eye and the pyramid were from a common fund of symbols that were available to anyone. You say but, it's often associated with Freemasonry, but uh, no. look, look at this too. You've got these 13 courses of bricks, and on this side you've got the 13 stars, you've got right. 13 leaves, 
13 berries, you've got right. 13 arrows. Paul, that is a lot of 13s. Yes, well, it's, uh, it was very deliberate, 13 for the 13 uh, states of the United States of America. Nothing at all odd about that. So you don't think that anything here is a Masonic code? Based on a study of the evidence, I would say it's not. Uh, the designers of the seal and the Freemasons were using a common fond of images that were out there and that could be used by anybody. So while there's no doubt that Washington was founded by a Freemason, most of the city's supposed Masonic symbols are nothing of the sort. There is, though, one curious aspect of Brown's vision that I still need to investigate. His incredible claim that godlike powers lie dormant within us all. Dan Brown's novel, The Lost Symbol, is a start-to-finish chase across Washington, D.C. The forces of good and evil struggle over the possession of secret ancient knowledge that can give man divine power. Both sides will stop at nothing to control these secrets. In the book, the baddie manages to smuggle a severed hand into the Capitol, and he mounts it on a wooden stand and leaves it with the bloody index figure pointing up at the ceiling. It's an invitation to a quest in the manner of the ancients, and it's the first of a whole series of clues that pepper the book. But what the finger is pointing up at is really curious. The mural on the ceiling of the rotunda, the apotheosis of Washington, is an intriguing artwork. It captures a mythical moment when George Washington is seemingly transformed from mortal man into God. This could simply be veneration for the father of a new nation, but Dan Brown thinks it's much, much bigger. To find out what, I've had to head back to the old world. Dan Brown tells us that before it even went to America, the secret knowledge that inspired that painting was passed down from ancient Egypt and entrusted to a clandestine group of radical British scientists. Brown believes that this knowledge, the secret wisdom of all the ages, can unlock extraordinary abilities in the human mind and imbue mortal men with godlike powers. He explores this theme again and again and tells us that this knowledge was secretly lodged with a group of 17th century scientists, including Robert Boyle and the great Isaac Newton. It was so dangerous, he says, that they were forced underground, calling themselves the Invisible College. This building, housing Oxford's Museum of the History of Science, is where some of them met behind closed doors. In what way was the Invisible College invisible? Well, it wasn't really invisible for any kind of persecution reasons. It was a sort of society, a group of gentlemen coming together. All of them were men of high profile, all of them were high education, and all of them were men of great intellectual power. I thought that they were invisible because they were frightened of being persecuted for all their new ideas. Yeah. No, I mean, the kind of thing they were talking about came out of classical experimentation or classical writing, and also a very well-established English experimental and European experimental tradition into geomagnetism, into astronomy, into microscopy, into meteorology, into engineering science. There was an incredible openness when it came to discussing the natural world. I think invisible simply means a private group of friends. According to Dan Brown, the advances they made in human understanding were because they had access to ancient wisdom. Do you think that's right? I would regard that as nonsense lit up in bright neon lights and screaming it through megaphones. What they were drawing on was medicine, astronomy, chemistry, all of these kind of disciplines. There was no occult tradition in them. So you wouldn't buy into the notion that we've lost this ancient wisdom and if we can only refind it, then we'll be in at the birth of a whole new world? In no way whatsoever. I think we're dealing here with a trainload of fantasy and with a thimbleful of fact. Well, once again, my search for ancient secrets and godlike powers has stalled. But Dan Brown assures us the science in his book is all real. A good 
chunk of the lost symbol is given over to a discussion about noetic science, looking at the power of thought. Dan Brown even says that people can move solid objects just through their mind alone. Brown says that a focused thought can affect anything. The direction fish swim round in a bowl, the manner that cells split up in a petri dish, the way a plant grows. But is that kind of thing true? Or is it just a little bit far-fetched? Is it possible to wear a human soul? <laughs> it's been tried. It's been tried. And um, shall we say the results are decidedly mixed. What is noetic science? Parapsychology study of unusual powers of the mind, really some cutting-edge work. Do you think it's possible for thought to move things? I'm trying to levitate your chair right now. <laughs> no, actually, I don't think move things as such. Um, influence processes, yes, I think that may be possible. In the way that Dan Brown says? More or less, yes. But this is all still in the realm of research and experiment, isn't it? None of this is done and dusted. Oh, absolutely not, no, no. I mean, it's, it was rather amusing to, to get the flavor from Dan Brown's book that, uh, you know, we're on the verge of a breakthrough and we're going to be complete new understanding of human consciousness, but there's a long way to go. We're just beginning to scratch the surface on, on these issues. What would you say is the difference between the work that Dan Brown portrays and what you do? Probably the biggest difference is that Dan Brown's working off an imaginary budget that, that seems to have no limits, and, and parapsychology has always worked off of fairly tight budgets. Yeah, the only hardware that I've seen of yours is this laptop and this little thing that looks like a portable electric razor. This is a random number generator or random event generator. Dan Brown's got one of those, but I think it's a much bigger deal than this little thing. No doubt, and it's probably in, in pod five or wherever it is. Can I have a go? Want to have a go? Okay. So this is something which samples this random number generator and turns it into a display for the participant to look at. So what do I have to do here? Okay, your task is on this gauge over here. You want to push that needle over into the green zone, okay? okay using yeah, the power yeah. of your mind. And I just fire with the mouse, Click yeah? Click the button, yes. How many times am I going to have to do it? About 100. Left to its own devices, the computer will send the needle to random numbers. I must try to psychically override it and consistently push it towards the highest score on the dial. Just with the power of my mind. Give myself a headache. A hundred. OK, OK. So how did I do? Well, Tony, I'm afraid uh, basically nothing is extraordinary in your performance. So average would be along that yellow line. Oh, that is dead average right there, and that's about where you ended up. Started off well. I had superpowers up here. Didn't that back I? then, yes, yes. What are these two lines here, the black one and the red one? Okay, the black one and the red one are what we call probability envelopes. And if you had ended up above one of those, then the overall result would have been what we call statistically significant. So if I'd got up here, I'd have had godlike powers. Um, perhaps not godlike, but we would have asked you to come back. Even though I was so boringly average in my experiments, I do know that some of the work that Richard has done has come up with some quite remarkable results. But the point is that neither he nor anybody else yet knows why. It may be that at some time in the future he'll come up with something extraordinary that makes us have to completely rethink our understanding of the mind. On the other hand, maybe this whole business is a scientific cul-de-sac, but at the moment they're just in the foothills. They're not about to come up with something world-shattering like Einstein and Newton and Galileo did. And that is the exact opposite of the way Dan Brown describes this kind of work in his book. His noetic science just isn't stacking up. So what about the amazing laboratories back in DC? They must be real. In the book, our heroine Catherine Solomon has her world-leading noetic laboratory at the Smithsonian Museum Support Center. I'm back in Washington, and that is where I'm going. The book says that the Smithsonian Support Center is at the cutting edge of noetic research. Well, it's actually situated in the outskirts of DC, and it's a complex that houses the museum's overspill collection. 
Catherine works in a sealed and sterile hangar called Pod 5. It's full of amazing machines like random event generators, which help her to understand the incredibly powerful forces that lie latent in the human mind. While Catherine is in here about to make some important scientific announcements that will in fact change the course of human history, the bad guy is outside trying to get in, determined to destroy all her work at any cost. This I've got to see. This is just like I imagined it would be from the book, Liz. What's in here? We have 55 million different things in here, so a lot of variety. What kind of stuff? Well, most of it's from the National Museum of Natural History, so things like plants and rocks and stuffed animals and skeletons. And do you really store it in pods? Yes, we have five storage pods. Can we see one? Yes, you can. That's in the book. Pod four. No turning back now. I can feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. Look at this. Is this real? Yes, it is. Black rhinoceros taken with a bow and arrow. Some arrow. This is amazing. Dan Brown talks about a canoe just like that in the book. This is the real deal. Liz, why have you got a big cat on a shopping trolley? It's in here getting a little refurbishment. Um, one of my staff has added some fur here, and she's repainted the mouth. She's still working on the teeth and did a little cleaning. You don't have a giant squid, do you? We do, but it's in a different pod. No wonder Dan Brown's heroine chose this place for her secret research. It's a real Aladdin's cave. Oh, this is, this is absolutely amazing. In the book, Catherine's assistant, Trish, gets murdered in this great big case with the giant squid in it. The baddie chucks her in at the top. He forced down, kicking and screaming, trying to remove the ethanol which is flooding into her lungs, but she fails absolutely and dies amid a tangle of tentacles. That's right, isn't it? Well, in the book, she did die in a tank like this, but that's an octopus. It doesn't matter. That, uh, this, is, this is just as near as you could possibly get. What about pod five? Where's pod five? You're in pod five. But pod five is gigantic and empty. No, it's gigantic, but it's completely full. We have 25 million specimens in here. What about the cube that Catherine does all her work in? No, we don't have a cube. So where do you do your noetics? We don't do noetics here. Nothing to do with mind over matter? No. Any spoon bending? No, but we do study squid. This is disaster. I was brought up so high in the air with a giant squid, and the next minute they come crashing to the ground because pod five isn't what we thought it was, the cube isn't here, and you don't do any noetics. No, and we don't have Trish in a tank either. Oh, come on. Another damp squid. It would seem that almost nothing of Dan Brown's book that we've investigated is quite as factual as he makes out. But what of Brown's assertion that even today, the Masonic ranks are stuffed with the great and the good, a state secret that must be preserved at all costs, or the entire edifice of American society will come crashing to the ground? Do the Freemasons really rule the world? I'm sure the answer lies in the House of the Temple, just a few blocks from the White House. The lost symbol climaxes in this very building. Our baddie is inside, trying to leak the covert video he shot of his own initiation ceremony. Featuring sinister death threats and disturbing rituals, it also shows the faces of rich and powerful Freemasons, including senators and the CIA director. If it gets out to the press, it threatens to bring the government crashing down. 
If anyone knows the truth, it's Brent Morris, one of the highest-ranking Masons in the United States. I ask if the Masonic ranks are full of the rich and powerful. While we are indeed extremely proud of, of members that we've had, the 14 presidents of the United States and the astronauts we've, we've had, the fact is that uh, nearly all Masons are uh, from the middle class. Does it bother you that an organization which was once so radical, both here and in Europe, is now almost the epitome of conservative middle class America? That is one of the ironies of Freemasonry. Uh, we were a cutting-edge organization, um, uh, feared by the church, feared by the state, because we espouse such radical principles as representative democracy, freedom of speech, and universal education. And today, you're, you're right, we are the epitome of middle class. Are you part of a big global plot? Tony, I'll tell you the truth. If we can't agree on what to serve at our ladies' banquet, it's hard to imagine we'd do, be very effective in taking over the world. Have a good tour, Tony. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. I finished my journey with a guided tour of lost symbol locations. After 12,000 carbon offset air miles, I'm right back where I started, empty-handed and without a jot of a lost symbol. It's been an entertaining romp, I've explored every nook and cranny of this city looking for Masonic clues, but to be honest, I've been frustrated at just about every turn. I think it's time to go home. So, what have I learned from the world's fastest selling novel of all time? Well, the monuments and the organisations may be real, but as for the rituals and the science, I think he's taken more than just a little bit of artistic licence there, don't you? I cannot find one piece of ancient knowledge anywhere, although there is plenty of mumbo-jumbo. And as for the way he treats the Masons, well, the ones I've met over here have been rather sweet. Not my cup of tea at all, personally, but hardly a threat to humanity. Now, if I have a big beef with Dan Brown, it's this. He was lazy. Why did he choose the Masons as the basis of a modern conspiracy thriller? It's been done before. But more importantly, why didn't he do what novelists are supposed to do? Make up a story and then tell it to us, instead of pretending it's all real. Having said that, I wonder who he'll have a go at next time. The Boy Scouts, maybe? Morris Dancers? The Women's Institute? I can't wait. <laughs>